Welcome to the Dream Journal. From the studios of KSQD in Santa Cruz, the Dream Journal is a weekly show where we explore the power of nighttime dreams through conversations with dream experts and with listeners like you. In the words of Carl Jung, who looks outside dreams, who looks inside, awakens. Today's music is called Evaluary. Join us for a conversation about psychedelics with facilitator Steve Elfrink of Om Tyra Psychedelics. What do dreams and psychedelics have in common? Also, microdosing. I am your host, Catherine Bell of Experiential Dreamwork, and welcome to the Dream Journal. Well, happy birthday, Dream Journal. Today marks the fifth anniversary of this show. As you may have seen, if you're following us on social media, the Dream Journal is going through a rebranding. So check us out on Instagram and Facebook and follow hashtag the Dream Journal to find out about upcoming shows and so much more. We are also a weekly podcast. You can subscribe, rate, and review wherever you find that podcast. But most importantly, I'd love this to be an opportunity for you to talk to your friends about dreams. I'm on a mission to increase people's awareness and appreciation for dreaming. You can find archives at all those podcast places, also ksqd.org slash the dash dream dash journal, and now on PRX. I'd like to welcome Steve Elfrank. Hello. Good morning. Okay, good morning morning to you. Let me introduce Steve. Steve Elfrank is the founder of Om Terra, a psychedelic therapy organization. He is also co-founder of the Rogue Valley Psychedelic Society and the subject matter expert for Webdelics, an online resource for psychedelics. He is a fresh voice to the more harrowing and less discussed challenges that come with psychedelic therapy. You can find Steve at omterra.org, O-M-T-E-R-R-A dot org. So, so Steve, glad to have you on the show here. Well, thank you so much for the invitation and uh, happy birthday, happy anniversary Absolutely. for your show. That's, you. that's amazing and huge. It has been quite a ride since 2019 when we began this show. Many, many changes, and, uh, and yet uh, our passion for dreams stays the same and only grows. Yeah, I really appreciate all your efforts and you know, getting dreams out there. I mean, for me, anything that kind of destigmatizes non-ordinary states of consciousness, and I would include dreams in that, to just kind of normalize and bring these different states into more of our awareness. It can all, it all help the collective. Yeah. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit more about how you got started with psychedelics, but let's start do that a little bit later. If it's okay with you, let's jump right into some parallels between dreams and the psychedelic state, as you're already alluding to. They are alternative states. And what what do you see as similarities and differences? Uh, the biggest similarity is the access to you know primary consciousness, where dreams live, and then also where psychedelics can take us. And so there's this rich material, you know, what's kind of controlling us 24-7, you know, from this base operating system is this place of primary consciousness. So for me, dreams are, you know, this beautiful built-in system that we have to, you know, try to make meaning of life, to process the day, move things through, bring new awarenesses in, so it's a place of information mm, yes. and healing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I mean, the you know, obvious direct parallel to that is how psychedelics have this, a similar ability to take us into this place of primary consciousness, of a place of dreams, of this non-linear, non-rational, um, expanded state. And, you know, some, well, it's, I was going to say there's some other differences, but I think there's so many parallels so it's going to go into, you know, psychedelics can take us into deeper places, but you know, I've personally had experiences in dreams 
that were almost, you know, full on psychedelic. Right. I, I have as well. And, and, and I've even had dreams about literally being on psychedelics in my dream. Like this is <laughs> kind of a theme for me, actually, of where I've been drugged and I'm like in a non-ordinary state of consciousness it, while I'm dreaming, which is kind of a double, a yes. double whammy. I've had that experience also. Uh, so uh -huh. they're, I mean, they're both just portals into this, you know, the funny thing, it's a portal into this other dimension, but this other dimension always exists. It's mm. always operating at some level. Mm. But then with psychedelics, there can be spiritual realms, but those spiritual realms are also, they're always there. And through dreams, psychedelics, we're just given a greater ability to access these places because we have secondary consciousness offline. And, you know, secondary consciousness is where we're trying to make meaning of the world and, you know, trying to figure out how we're going to pay the mortgage this month and what we should uh, cook for dinner tonight. Okay, now you compare that to primary consciousness. Maybe say a little bit more about that. Well, secondary, this comes out of primarily the work of Robin Carhart Harris, oh, yeah. um, who's the main researcher, was at Imperial College of London, a psychedelic researcher um, from Imperial College of London, where he did a bulk of his work, and now he's at uh, University of San Francisco. But he's the one who really, you know, there's always been Freud's, uh, you know, uh, conscious, subconscious. And then there's also been, you know, Robin Carhart Harris isn't the one who brought primary consciousness, secondary consciousness to the world. But he's the one who's really uh, brought it more to the forefront because mm -hmm. it has, I think, a greater application when discussing psychedelics. So secondary consciousness, the way, you know, he frames it is that place of cognitive thinking like right now you and i the listeners in santa cruz there are primarily operating in secondary consciousness mm -hmm. where we're hearing listening uh getting an understanding watching also the sparrow landed you know outside the window i mean just mm -hmm. present moment awareness mm -hmm. and you know at work we're in secondary consciousness the majority of our waking time we're in secondary consciousness so it's like that cognitive get stuff done Okay. And it's a beautiful thing because that's what allows us to get stuff done and invent and create. And then what's operating underneath all that, though, again, 24-7 is primary consciousness. And primary consciousness is also where you know, dreams live, this non-rational, non non-linear, timeless, but also trauma. So the kind of the core source of trauma is also held within primary consciousness and then also within the body. But kind of the the bulk of it and the bulk of childhood memories or repressed memories or dissociative amnesia, if we get more down the rabbit hole, mm -hmm. all resides within primary consciousness. But primary consciousness is constantly knocking every day, every minute. You know, it's how we if we're triggered, you know, someone says something and we have we don't have a response, but we have a pretty big reaction. Mm. We're, probably, we're tapping into primary consciousness where typically for most folks, a lot of folks. That's also where that wounded child exists. Mm. That, you know, so that child who never got to express themselves, uh, they can live under this lid of dissociation. Dissociation lives in primary consciousness and triggered. And also in that little kid, it's like, oh, opportunity. So primary consciousness can, you know, totally, you know, at any moment emerge out into secondary consciousness. So you know, there's a direct portal between the two. There's like a, yeah, it, it reminds me of this analogy I've heard um, about uh, the stars versus the sun. And like in the during the daytime, the sun is so bright, we can't see the stars, but they're still there. And so, yes. but at night, the sun goes down, uh, maybe like when our secondary consciousness goes to sleep, and then we can see the stars. And so the primary consciousness comes out. Uh, if that's, you know, the primary consciousness is the stars and the secondary is the sun. So that it's still there in the daytime. And I love how you talk about how it bursts through in moments of uh, reaction or when it's, when we're touching into a wounded place. And that primary consciousness can get activated even during the daytime, even while we're trying to focus on, on the present moment, trying to focus on yes. what needs to be done. <laughs> Yeah, so we can get hijacked by primary consciousness. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing there also is the body 24-7, 365, our entire life, seeks homeostasis. Mm -hmm. So homeostasis is just a normal operating system. Like our body, one example of homeostasis would be 
our body at 98.6 degrees. Mm -hmm. So body will do anything to keep us at 98.6, you know, just on average 98.6. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we start to exert ourselves, we sweat, you know, respiration increases, but everything is geared by body to keep us at 98.6. Mm -hmm. So the same thing holds true with you know, any level of trauma that we're holding or anything that's unresolved. Body's trying to work it through. In the body, oh. When I say body, I should include, you know, primary consciousness slash body, uh, nerve, the autonomic nervous system. It's trying to process what needs to be processed. So body knows how to process trauma, but we suppress, you know, kind of secondary consciousness is also the great kind of suppressor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to go there. We don't want to feel that. The we're going to take deep breath. <laughs> we're gonna do, you know, grab the Ben and Jerry's. Uh, yes. And everything to not go there, but body is constantly, and again, when I say body, I'm really got to keep adding it into primary consciousness slash body, mm -hmm. uh, constantly trying to process. And the same thing happens in dreams. It's really, for me, dreams are one of, you know, our primary consciousness, one of its efforts to kind of clean house, trying to seek homeostasis, trying to process things, right. trying to process, you know, the day and trying to release what needs to be released. Mm -hmm. I love the, there's a phrase I've heard about dreaming that it's like an, it, part of our emotional immune system, like trying to get us in, into balance and yeah, to clean yes, up yes. things. Because we might say like, why would I need to uh, worry about that primary consciousness if i can function just fine during the day then what what is well i guess maybe that's the if that is the big if is is if i am functioning just fine during the day like why do we uh, why is it valuable to pay attention to that primary consciousness and then i want to get into how psychedelics and dreaming for that matter help us actually do that why do we want to pay attention yeah. i think every one of us um has some level of unresolved emotional, I don't want to call it baggage, but just unresolved, unintegrated emotions mm. from primarily from childhood. I read this recently, and I think it's spot on that as adults, we're really working on, you know, processing that first seven years of our life. Mm -hmm. That's our, what our job as an adult is trying to process all that, what happened to us in that zero to seven, you know, the most formative phase of our life. So anyone and everyone has some level of unintegrated emotions. There's something in there that's controlling their life every day. So some, not, I wouldn't say controlling is a little too strong, but it's arising. It's presenting itself. Anytime you're triggered, that's some level of unintegrated emotion that is, exists in primary consciousness. Right. As Young talks about the complexes, the things that, that take over our consciousness when we're in the, this triggered state, you're used to the word triggered and, and yes. like when there's something and that would say that uh, going with our current analogies, that was something that's rising up from primary consciousness from an unhealed wound. That, okay. yes. And we all have, you know, different unhealed wounds and, you know, and trauma needs to be kind of redefined because trauma for most folks means, you know, some bad event happened, you know, bad car accident, some form of, you know, physical abuse mm -hmm. or something else. But there's also, you know, some people will call it soft trauma or small T trauma, capital T trauma. Hmm. But any level of neglect as a child from that zero to seven, a narcissistic mother, a, you know, Overworked bully brother. Mother, just a really busy, right? I'm sorry? I, I mean, overworked mother. Like it could even just be kind yeah. of incidental trauma. And yes, it, and yet it feels like neglect to the child. Yeah, because as a child, we're 100% wired biologically. We come into this world expecting love, nurturance, compassion, appreciation, being held, our needs being met. And if any of that's not happening at any degree, again, it can't be, it can even be you know, unintentional from the mother or the father, but sometimes things, and also it depends on the sensitivity of that child. Mm. You know, so there's so many factors that go into that zero to seven. But if we're not getting those needs met and we're not being seen or received or felt or heard or nurtured, a lot of times a young child will start to internalize that as I'm bad, I did something wrong. Because parents, you know, our primary caregivers are gods. They're, you know, responsible for our, you know, survival. Mm -hmm. And they can do no wrong. So we can internalize so much as we did something wrong if 
this biological you know needs aren't being met so there can be so what i'm trying to say here really is that there's so many different levels of you know we can call it trauma or unintegrated feelings and emotions and sensations even mm. that get stuck and held in primary consciousness so for me the value of primary consciousness is it's this built-in you know sub basement operating system that is designed along with the body's you know innate wisdom to heal us you know, like if we get out of the way mm-hmm. and that's what you know we're you know segue into psychedelics if we get out of the way the body primary consciousness can do its magic which is process unintegrated emotions move stuff through and then the you know so the beauty within primary consciousness with its timelessness you know a lot of anyone with any levels of trauma uh, usually has attachment issues and there's a whole we could go deep into attachment issues but a lot of children a lot of kids never bonded or attached to a parent because there wasn't someone fully there to bond to mm-hmm. but even in the primary consciousness because all that is timeless you can form you know attachments mm-hmm. into you know kind of going down a rabbit hole here a little bit <laughs> I'm with you <laughs> I'm with but you. there's a way for that you know bonding and attachment to happen in primary consciousness that ripples back to that two-year-old Yes, yes. And so by healing ourselves in the moment, we actually are healing our past selves. It's something, if I, if I could take it another step farther, that that's the way I look at dream work and psychedelic work as well, I think. Is that something that resonates for you? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I think, you know, dreams are, what's, I'm trying to think of the word. Um, there's so much potential. Like there should be more, you know, and I appreciate what you're doing, Catherine, getting the word out about dreams, but there should be, you know, there's a great awareness on psychedelics and I would love to see the equivalent around dreams because there's so much potential there Mm -hmm. for folks. Absolutely. You're you're preaching to the choir. So, um, gosh, oh, so, um, you know, I'm just, I I have a couple different things popping up for me. I guess let's go to like, how do psychedelics help that? Like, I I, I love that you brought in Robin Carhart Harris. Carhart Harris's work because I've I've read a little bit of his stuff and seen some uh, videos of him and he talks about a process called uh, Rebus, the uh, Relax Believe under psychedelics and um, and I wonder if that's something that he still is a proponent of something that you agree with and I think it applies to dreaming as well Relax beliefs under dreaming so there's a way that we relax our beliefs and so we get to shift them while we're in these altered states. And I, I, is there a better way? Is there a way that you prefer to look at this or is this something you're familiar with? No, yeah, familiar and totally agree. And you know, his other thing that he used to talk a lot about or, or really brought, brought to the forefront was just the default mode network. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How our brains, we get in these ruts of ABC, 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 where it can be, you know, my life sucks, my life sucks, my life, you know, we're just stuck in that loop. Mm-hmm. And it's like literally, you know, some people call it like a deep groove in an album and it's just on repeat or skipping. And the beautiful thing about psychedelics is they, you know, kind of bust that open a little bit. So instead of ABC, what it's going to do is, and this is also part of neuroplasticity, neuroplasticity, mm. where we're getting, you know, these new new links, new possibilities, new potentials, once that default mode network is kind of, you know, I don't want to say blown open, but expanded. Mm-hmm. So instead of going ABC, ABC, all of a sudden you realize it's actually A, R squared, zebra, <laughs> turbocharged, <laughs> on and on. I mean, just there's like, it opens up people to new possibilities. It takes people out of their cognitive Kansas and, you know, puts them into this new frame of mind. And But what it's doing is going within primary consciousness and kind of breaking up the, the cobwebs in there and allowing access to different possibilities, really. New connections, new awareness, new understanding, insight. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, dreams have that same potential. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so why can't I just take some ecstasy and go to a party? Like, would that be like a way to transform my consciousness? Or would it, I, I'm joking, of course, because, uh, you know, that might be a way to have a nice party. But I, I want to hear a little bit more about your process like I understand that what you do is you facilitate psychedelic therapy and I wonder if you want to say a little bit more about what psychedelic therapy is uh, and how it's beneficial yeah so for me there's 
kind of two levels of psychedelic therapy. And the, the classic level of psychedelic therapy is kind of what we're talking about as far as more of this insight model, mm -hmm. uh, expansive model, reframing, new understandings, you know, breaking out of the, you know, the cage of our minds into the universe, you know, and speaking of that, unity consciousness, we're all one. So it's more model one of psychedelic therapy is kind of the, the classic psychedelic therapy of, you know, these larger doses of psychedelics and then, you know, kind of going into these spiritual realms and, con you know, expanded consciousness states. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, what's the big focus is right now, you know, with all the studies, Johns Hopkins, UCLA, University of Wisconsin, I mean, on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Everyone's looking at these expanded states, mystical experience to bring insight into people. And then with the thought that, okay, with insight, we can heal depression. And which I, you know, I'm one of the naysayers. I mean, I believe in that model and I believe it's powerful and it's, you know, I wouldn't be here today without that model. So it can create these incredible shifts, but it's, you know, accessing one kind of one major aspect of primary consciousness. And, and for me, and that also with psychedelics at that level takes us, you know, increases the antenna into these different, you know, spiritual realms or, you know, further outside of mind and into, you know, the universe, literally. Mm -hmm. And then the second and more important, and this is, you know, the main focus of my work. So I, I do work with psilocybin. I'm a licensed facilitator in the state of Oregon. So it's a legal approach with psilocybin, mm -hmm. but it's meant to be a non-directive therapeutic and really just meant on meant to let people have a psychedelic or psilocybin experience, mm -hmm. which there is value in that. But my main focus is real uh, more on a somatic process. Um, for me, there's, you know, the mind, spirit, and I believe in more of this where this is where I come up, you know, frame my work as holistic psychedelic therapy. Mm -hmm. So for me, the foundation of for anyone is body. So if we have a pyramid, bodies at the bottom, and then mind, you know, fabric of reality, and then at the top is at the top of the pyramid would be that spiritual place, you know, transcendence, transegoic place. But at the bottom, we need the foundation of body mm -hmm. and not taking that, you know, top pointy thing of spiritual and trying to put that as our base, which can happen in the psychedelic community where it's all about you know, I call, you know, it can be psychedelic bypassing, there's spiritual bypassing, there can be psychedelic bypassing, yeah. where we're constantly chasing these experiences, looking for transcendence and these mystical experiences. I know in my own experience, I was transcending constantly mm -hmm. and, but really just trying to get away from my trauma. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then my basic tenant is insight does not heal trauma. Mm. So Ooh, that's worth repeating there. Insight does not heal trauma. Okay. No. Interesting. So, and I know, and also I want to say, I know people have gotten incredible benefits from psychedelics and trauma. And then also to recognize there's such a spectrum of trauma, you know, that's, I think also a lot of people, <clears throat> including a lot of therapists don't, no offense to therapists, but the complexity of trauma is, um, so complex. And I mean, as far as when it started, number of folks involved, family of origin, the person's personality, you know, the number of, you know, events, I mean, just on and on. Was there someone good in their life? Mm -hmm. On and on and on and on. And so for me, and this is, you know, for my, I've always been my own guinea pig, my own lab rat yeah. of trying to figure out why, 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 you know, cause, why was I, you know, suicidal at an early age? Why was I in a psych ward for suicide attempts? Why was um, this constant anxiety, depression, intrusive thoughts, suicidal ideation, you know, it kept coming back. I'd get all this insight in the world and then I would be back after six months, you know, or three weeks. But this baseline of anxiety, depression kept coming back, mm -hmm. even with all the insight. So segue to, yeah, the for me, the most important aspect of psychedelic therapy is the foundational element of body. Mm -hmm. And so when I say body, that's also, we're still talking about primary consciousness, but it's where all this held charge, held reactivity lives is within body, within primary consciousness, subset body, 
and then specifically in the autonomic nervous system. So, and this is also what, you know, if someone's going experiencing depression, anxiety, 90% of that, I mean, there can be some here and now, but if it's constant and throughout their life, there's something in that zero to seven that is unresolved and just slowly, event, always just kind of, I call it off-gassing, releasing this mm -hmm. anxious child mm -hmm. who never got to fully feel everything is just, you know, any opportunity to just let a little of this anxiety out. Mm -hmm. So there's this, you know, my focus is using psychedelics, my greatest focus is using, on psych, using psychedelics to ex access primary consciousness and then within pri primary consciousness, the subset of body slash autonomic nervous system. So does this still involve these massive doses or is this more no, in the realm this of is more, there's, Yeah, it's more um, what would be called psycholytic dose. Oh, okay. So what's interesting in the 60s, uh, when most, you know, late 50s, 60s, when most of the research in psychedelics was going on, and in the U.S., it was really a, a focus on more large dose, you know, large doses of LSD, large doses of psilocybin, non-directive headphones, eye shades. Right. And that's the, the classic model in Europe at the same time. Uh, what they were doing, you know, Stanislav Graf in uh, the Czech Republic back then was, you know, one of the one also, well, he was working with high dose and also psycholytic. So psycholytic is, it's not a microdose, but it's just a smaller dose. Hmm. Um, so like with LSD, it might be like 50 micrograms. Hmm. Uh, with psilocybin, it could be, you know, anywhere about 500 um, milligrams. So these kind of lower dose, what allows the person to still be online. Hmm, yeah. And then allowing, you know, so what we're trying to do there is just get secondary consciousness offline. So executive functioning, secondary consciousness offline, and then allowing us, and this is much more directive approach for the facilitator or therapist to then start kind of working through some of that stuff in uh, primary consciousness. So that working through by, you mean by talking about, so there's more, it's like an interactive, like a therapy session, but with a, with a dose? Yeah, it can be interactive. So it came out of, in Europe, uh, psychodynamic therapy was very big. And it's a very directive, um, not it's talk therapy, but it's a much more directive approach to talk therapy, mm -hmm. a much deeper dive. And the way I work with it is taking it another step. And it's a directive approach, but it's really focused on specifically on trauma. Mm -hmm. So in this, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the model I work with comes out of the lineage of uh, Peter Levine, who a lot of people are uh, familiar with. Yep. Uh, he started somatic experiencing. Um, but he's the, the, probably the per first person, uh, Bessel van der Kolk and yep. Peter Levine were the first guys to bring in this awareness around body and how the body holds trauma. So body, body, body for trauma. Mm -hmm. So then, so there's Peter Levine and then a gentleman named Eric Walterstorff who took Peter Levine's work to another level of focusing in on body for trauma and a more focused approach and a more focused approach to work with dissociation, which, you know, there's fight, flight, or freeze, freezes dissociation. Mm -hmm. And then a gentleman named Saj Razvi took it Eric's work to another level and started adding, he added MDMA into it as part of, he was a, a therapist out of uh, Denver, Colorado. And he added MDMA because he was part of the phase one FDA study um, for MDMA. And back then it was pretty loose. You could use any model. So he was taking Eric's model and then applying, um, using MDMA in that process and finding great results. And then it segued through uh, private practice that he was involved with into adding in cannabis and ketamine because they are legal and accessible. Mm -hmm. And long story short, the beautiful thing here is, you know, for me, the bulk of my work is I'm working with low dose ketamine mm -hmm. and low dose cannabis. Mm -hmm. So in a psycholytic approach to just get mind off and then a process, and this could be a whole show. Yeah, I absolutely. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> running short on time, uh -huh, but, um, uh -huh. But what it allows is, and through this process called selective inhibition, you inhibit all standard coping mechanisms mm -hmm. under this low dose um, ketamine or cannabis. Typically, I use a combo of the two. 
and go through a little body medita meditation, focusing body, body, body. Mm -hmm. And if body, if you can't take that deep breath, you can't scratch your nose, you can't lick your lips, you can't nod your head, can't fidget your fingers, the system pressurizes. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden there's going to be activation. Mm -hmm. And so this activation is now what we're doing is activating the autonomic nervous system with that's been somewhat suppressed by secondary consciousness, allowing everything that's been held, all these held reactivity, held charge to come out. And it comes out primarily through sensations. Mm -hmm. And it's very intense and very powerful, but for me, it's the only thing I could find in my you know, everlasting quest for why, 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 and trying to find resolution. Mm -hmm. Uh, was focusing on body and the early childhood trauma yeah. and some that I wasn't even aware of, which is common for a lot of folks. Well, let's get started. into let's hold that, and I want to okay. I want to get into that in the second half when we're going to get more personal and I'll sure. hear some more of your particular stories, which I've been fascinating. I've been reading about online, so it's not like a secret because it's all on your webpage. Mm -hmm. uh, so Steve L. Frank is our guest today. The webpage is Om Terra O M. T E R R A dot O dot org. I think I might have said dot com at the top. Is Om Terra? I think you, I think you did. You said dot org. Oh, good. Thank. Okay. Yeah. Om Terra dot org. So, uh, so you are listening to the Dream Journal, and we'll be back after this short break. We are broadcast live from the KSQD studios in Santa Cruz, and co-broadcast live in San Jose by KCXU. Welcome back to the Dream Journal. Uh, my name is Catherine Bell, and I'd let you like to let you know that now is the time to look into joining this year's IASD conference, which is happening at a 13th century abbey in the Netherlands, June 8th through 12th. Next year, Will is looking like it'll be a virtual online conference, which is wonderful in certain ways. But if you like that in-person experience, then uh, you might want to get your trip in this year. So you can go to asdreams.org for more information. Um, next week, we'll be talking about emotional intelligence and how to become better stewards instead of exploiters of the earth. Our guests are Norman Brown and Marsha Hudson. So we welcome back Steve Elkfrank of Om Terra Holistic Psychedelic Therapy at omterra.org. So, Steve, we have so much to talk about. Yes, it's, it's a big rabbit hole. <laughs> it really is. You know, it's very fascinating. And, um, you know, we were talking about those zero to seven year old traumas that tend to uh, kind of form the backdrop of our existence, that primary consciousness that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the highlights is that zero. Like, I've really been mulling over the fact that every human was born like there's some way that we started out in a nice comfy womb and then we were thrust out you know yes. whether uh, through conventional birth or through cesarean in, in more very abruptly into a, a very different world and so even though we might have had the most loving childhood you could imagine there's still that moment of uh, of being uh, ripped from the womb that uh, that we begin with and maybe there's something about why water is such a common uh, metaphor for a place that's peaceful and uh, and beautiful because we're remembering back to the womb and I wondered if you could tell a little bit about your history with psychedelics and how you got started with that and what you found out about your trauma you hinted about being suicidal at age four being institutionalized in the late teens because of suicide uh, being you know attempts and uh, maybe you could get a little more personal and tell us what your journey has been Sure. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that opportunity. And yeah, it is a beautiful thing that we 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 know state zero and state zero would be you know, like where every system, everything in our whole bodies is our whole body is just chill. Uh -huh. That would be state zero. Yeah. But we came in, you know, at one point we all experienced state zero. Hmm. And, you know, that is, you know, that womb like state. In the womb, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then life happens. Mm -hmm. Right. 
<laughs> including starting out with being born. I mean, and then the, everything from that moment afterwards, there's there's hunger, there's discomfort, there's cold, which all these things we never experienced in the womb. That, yeah. And the, yeah, I'll dive into me in, in a bit. And just I want to add to that. And with that, those levels of discomfort, but if there's someone there that, you know, because as a child and as an infant, we can't soothe. But if there's someone there that's, you know, constantly nurturing us, constantly, you know, returning us to state zero. Mm -hmm. So that's where, you know, like breastfeeding is so important, you know, the mother being with the child as much as possible in those, you know, especially early months. And I know it's tough for any mom mm -hmm. to, yep. you know, be there 24 seven. Um, so I'm not, you know, want to ever put any guilt around that. But if a child has, these opportunities to, you know, keep returning to state zero, it really starts to set a really strong foundation for that little nervous system. Mm -hmm. And if it's not there right off the bat, um, that's when, you know, stuff starts, you know, that state zero starts to get kind of out of whack. Mm -hmm. So my story, so my story, you know, again, this could be um, a novel, literally. Yes, I'm sure. <clears throat> so I'm, excuse the big clear throat clear. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was uh, really this question at an early age. And I think also I'm one of those people that I have always had just this insatiable quest for knowledge and meaning and understanding. And it's something that, you know, even as a young, you know, six year old, um, there was always there. Like, why, 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 why? And questioning. Mm -hmm religion, questioning everything I was told, and just in this constant pursuit for the truth or what I knew was out there. So I think just internally, personality-wise, whatever, I've always been on this quest. So a big quest for me was, you know, as I got a little bit older of this why, you know, why was I, you know, suicidal age? It was somewhere between four and five where I would, and this is kind of going forward, a trigger warning. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I'm going to, you know, temper it back. But uh, some of this, you know, I'm, I'm pretty open about and I, I have no shame or anything around my past. Uh, but I also want to honor other folks where they're at. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, my how I earliest memories of like something doesn't make sense here was this, you know, suicidal, you know, kid who at four or five, I would, you know, brought up Christian, conservative, you know, southeast Minnesota. And there'd be, my prayer would be the classic, now I lay me down to sleep and then oh. whatever the rest of that was. And then would be, please God, kill me in my sleep. Please yeah. God. Oh, that's, that's a so, scary thing to be having our kids mumble over every night before bed. <laughs> so that's how I'd go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And then I'd continue that kind of end mantra um, as I was trying to fall asleep. And then I'd wake up alive and then angry at God mm -hmm. and also feeling like, well, I'm so bad, so unworthy, God won't even take, you know, a second out of his busy day to, you know, kill me. Mm. So really early stuff there. And then that continued as this kind of depressed, introverted kid. Also looking back in hindsight, levels of dissociation would pop in where I would be walking to school, but then wouldn't remember, you know, all of a sudden I'd be on this, you know, walking on the sidewalk, and I wouldn't remember how I got to that point on the sidewalk. Mm. And that happened a lot. So it's just these big dissociative gaps were kicking in. Mm -hmm. And then I'll try to really condense this, but I kind of like with the psychedelics, what I ended up going through was kind of first this recreational phase. Mm -hmm. So I started, you know, for me, I found alcohol at age 13 and other drugs, and but it was this place of relief. I finally found relief from this internal depression, anxiety, that's not really talked about or, you know, you know, it's not something parents aren't really, are really aware of, I was just so internal. But I found soulless peace, uh, an escape um, through, you know, drugs, alcohol, and then at 16, LSD came into the picture. So there's a really intense recreational phase and it was um, not been, I mean, it did keep me alive to some degree because it was just this escape valve that I found. And with LSD, I found I could drink more, I could party more. Mm. Um, but it was also started to give me some glimmers of something else. So I was also doing these, you know, like high dose LSD sessions. Um, very, very high, um, crazy high. And but in those really high sessions, 
little glimmers, but I was still, you know, using mass amounts of alcohol, other drugs with that. But so that recreational thing was more of an escape. Mm-hmm. And then segued into more of a psychonaut phase for, um, you know, because I did end up in psych ward and ended up in a drug treatment center, ended up in a halfway house. This is in early 20s. And then kind of shifted out of that into this really hardcore psychonaut phase where, you know, massive doses of LSD combined with ketamine, combined with blinking LED eye shades and binaural beats with deep <laughs> sounds. So it was this, but it was also, I was trying to like, you know, and I had this, like, I want to break through. Mm-hmm. I want to find the answer. I want to, but again, I'm trying to transcend the pain. But even that, in that psychonaut phase and doing, again, doing large doses of everything. But no big breakthroughs, but just this attempt to transcend. And then what really changed my life was, I, I you know, made it through, col- you know, kind of got my life together. Got through college, got, you know, good job, corporate job. I was the corporate guy. And, you know, I was doing everything the culture told me to do. And then it was still like super, you know, this raging depression came back again and raging suicidality. And I was at a point where I was going to do something I knew would be kind of like the final solution. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, I was going to give myself a choice, you know, try option A, which was going to be one final huge dose. And it was like 1200 micrograms. So it's standard to be about 100 micrograms, if you dose 300 micrograms. But I did chose to do 1,200 micrograms and then had, you know, this uh, other option waiting for me if that didn't work or if the experience just went into awful hell realms, I could end it quickly. So this was, I was about 29. And then from that moment or that day or actually that night, I was by myself, which I never recommend, but I was this, mm-hmm. just so desperate by myself in my apartment, Scottsdale, Arizona. And that night, yeah, my life changed. I wouldn't be here, uh, honestly, unequivocally say I wouldn't be here if that, you know, what happened that night happened. What happened that night was the most, you know, the classic mystical unity experience, white light, all is one, I'm one with everything. You know, I became shimmering white light was looking at the bathroom mirror at one point and this is pretty early on and my face was the most beautiful face that ever existed but then my face then morphed into and I can still see it to this day this trail of every face that ever existed mm. and every face that ever existed was the most beautiful face because we all have this place in us this white light unity consciousness we are all one and it was, you know, that's a we, that's a term that stated, you know, we're all one. But, you know, to experience it mm. um, fully and to embody that is a whole other experience. And then so it went the majority, about six hours of that session, I was just laying on the floor with this reciprocal circulation of love. It's, there was this like love, gratitude, bliss, compassion, grace. Um, I don't know if I said gratitude, mm-hmm. but just this swirl of white light, and, you know, my apartment's gone, and but I was just part of the cosmos, and this light was streaming in me, but I was also re- reciprocal, so it was coming through me and then out of me, and I was feeding it back into the universe and receiving from the universe this universal love. Mm-hmm. And in that place, there was, you know, also tears of gratitude, tears of grief. You know, I was, I would call myself a nihilist prior to this, you know, and I, you know, f- I'm not a religious guy, but, you know, at some levels, I, you know, I found God. I found, you know, meaning. I never had meaning. And that I was part of something. I never far- felt part of anything. So it was a huge transformation. You know, and I came out of it the next day. And, you know, the suicidality got, was gone, the depression was gone, everything was gone, mm-hmm. and everything came in as far as, you know, receiving the universe, receiving, you know, who I was in the universe. So kind of a feeling of rebirth, reborn, and then so huge life-changing experience. But then this, I'm going to kind of make this next part a little faster, yeah. just in expediency here. So then what I found, though, so I had this huge breakthrough, and it changed my life, you know, sort 
discovered, oh, there's organic food. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, and I, you know, found, you know, the a guy, uh, this Alan, Alan Shockley, who I, you know, huge part of my life uh, in Tucson, Arizona, who was, you know, quarter Cherokee, but introduced me into like shamanic, and you know, uh, rituals and, you know, earth-based rituals, sweat lodges, and just this whole new paradigm that I never knew existed, but it just, that experience just opened me up into new possibilities. Primal scream therapy, ecstatic dance. I was, you know, this conservative dude. I've always been, you know, definitely on the liberal side, but little, little Southeast, very conservative Rochester, Minnesota, and then just, mm. you know, blown open in a good way. But what I found is, so I'm doing all this work, all this beautiful work, and, but eventually this place of suicidality, suicidal ideation, I never went fully back into suicidality um, to where, you know, no, no ever, I never had another suicide attempt. Um, but this kind of baseline of what I was very familiar with kept coming back. And so, you know, so I kind of went into the spiritual therapeutic phase where I was, you know, now doing medicine more, again, from trying to heal myself through insight. So I was doing, you know, did Ibogaine, did peyote, DMT. Um, I want to think a little tangent, um, Ibogaine and dreams. I mean, there's a whole show you could do on Ibogaine and dreams. Mm -hmm. It's probably the psychedelic that's most aligned with dream work. Oh. But that's a tangent. Um, but what I found again and again and again, I kept getting these breakthroughs and then stuff would come back. And then also I'd started getting, finding the pitfalls and perils and the scary stuff about psychedelics. I went through a three-day ayahuasca ceremony and then ended up kind of losing a year of my life where I would go in and out of now understanding it. But I was... At the time, I had no clue. I didn't understand. I you know, also had birth trauma, and I didn't know about the birth trauma. But I, now in hindsight, I knew I was just looping in birth trauma for literally a year. And so in very destabilized state, depersonalization, derealization, could be taken out anywhere from three minutes to eight hours where it felt like my body was being ripped in two, which was forceps delivery. Mm. But... It's, I was just stuck in this state. So, and also I, you know, ended up in an FDA study for psilocybin, doing three doses over three months, escalating doses. Um, it was pharmacokinetics, so looking at blood serum levels, and then also looking at adverse reactions from high dose psilocybin. So, being a 6'1 Dutch guy, big frame, um, ended up getting the largest dose in uh, published FDA history. So, and that was the classic Hopkins model, headphones, eye shades, mm -hmm. and, but three doses of just hell realms, mm. awful, you know, what some, you know, on some levels, bad trips. I, but again, I was just looping in trauma with no resolution, just looping and looping and looping in trauma in these hell realms. And then the third dose, I did have a bit of a breakthrough, a very profound experience, and I did have some resolution or not res I had temporary resolution from a lot of the what I was going through. Mm. Hey, Steve, I want to jump in here. I have a quick sure. question from um, um, from Max in the studio here. Sure. Um, who's, what questions? Uh, okay. Hi, Steve. Hi. Uh, my question is: the talk you're giving is very compelling, and it's leading me and probably everybody who's listening to think that they maybe should try this. Except for the hell realms, and well, what about that? Well, <laughs> actually, you know, whatever. But like the whole psycholytic idea is good. Is there a governing body, or a licensing body, or some loose organization or association of uh, practitioners that somebody who is say in like uh, Georgia or Missouri or Illinois could contact? or out on the West Coast here could contact some national thing? Uh, the sad answer is no, as far as any um, really effective organization that has a list of all practitioners. And then it's def you know different states. You know, Oregon currently is the only state where there's legal access to psilocybin. Uh, there's some, like Oakland has decriminalized, so, you know, pretty much all psychedelics. So there's, you know, people facilitating sessions in Oakland. Uh, it's decriminalized in Denver. 
mm -hmm. uh, soon to be legalized in Colorado. But there's, it's one of the, you know, lacking resources um, out there as far as finding facilitators and then finding, you know, the other challenge is finding a good facilitator. Right. But there's, you know, one company is Third Wave that has a directory, mm -hmm. um, but it's not complete. I mean, it's, you know, a fraction of who's out there. Um, Psychable, I, I always mess up their name. Uh, Psychable is another one. It's like, I'm not even gonna try, but it's yeah. like Psych and then Able, Psychable. And, those are the two yeah. biggest ones I'm aware of. Well, thank you. Thank you, Max. That's helpful. I, I appreciate that question. And we we really do need to wrap up. So I wonder if, Steve, if you have a um, some some su suggestions for our listeners. And uh, this is Steve Elfrink from omterra.org. And if you have any, like, encouragements and cautions for listeners as we wrap up the show. Yeah, I think the big thing would be, there. you know, psychedelics are profound, amazing, incredible uh, life-changing substances and, you know, huge benefit for a lot of folks and for the culture at large. And there's also a bit of a myth out there that one dose of psilocybin and depression is cured. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, one dose of psilocybin can put you on the path. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's rare that, you know, and I know there's studies saying, you know, there's a, these benefits and there are benefits but it's more of, for me, just for anyone to understand it's a path. Because that one session may give you a breakthrough, may give you insight, but you have to keep working it. So the whole integration process, and it's you know, there's probably gonna be another session in there. And then if there's anyone with trauma, really proceed with caution. If you've got complex PTSD, proceed with caution. Okay. And then I would just, you know, put more awareness to, you know, any somatic approach with psychedelic therapy and also looking at psycholytic therapy for folks with trauma. Mm. Thank you so much, Steve. Steve Alfred, this is a pleasure and we have plenty more we could talk about. So who knows? Yeah. We didn't even, I'm even going to slip in there. Webdelics, just the, which is a wonderful podcast hosted yes. by Scott Mason, who has a lot to say about psychedelics and uh, one of those trusted resources that Steve Alfrink is also uh, one of the, uh, uh, what is your position at Webdelics? Um, and my official title right now is subject, subject matter expert. Ah, subject matter expert. Okay. Oh, and then one quick plug on that also sure. is I'm going to be doing a weekly editorial ah. that's going to start, I think, next week. On the Webdelics uh, podcast? On Webdelics, Oh, yeah. fantastic. Around um, all these wonderful topics. I look mm -hmm. forward to that. So thank you still from Alfred. This has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Catherine, uh, and all the work you're doing to get dreams out there. They're important. All right. Thank you so much. Yep. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, thank you all for listening. The Dream Journal is produced at the studios of KSQD in Santa Cruz, and we are live every Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific at ksqd.org. The podcast is released on the Monday after the show. I am Catherine Bell. You can find out about my dream coaching practice at experientialdreamwork.com. You can email me at katherine at ksqd.org. That's K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E -E at ksqd.org. Follow Experiential Dreamwork and hashtag The Dream Journal on Facebook and Instagram to find out about upcoming shows. And check out our new branding coming soon and celebrate our fifth year anniversary. Uh, I'd like to thank Rick Kleffel, music engineer, uh, Tony Rosamano, Max Deaton, and tomorrow morning when you wake up, take a minute to write down your dream and bring it to the next Dream Journal. Was what I learned in the old school is there's no fool like an old fool. Make the most of the moments you've got. No. Oh.